And then I was going to introduce you to everyone who doesn't know you. And thank you so much for sending over your information. Let me just pull that up right now. Serena, how do I pronounce your last name? Shoop. Shoop. Okay. That's what I thought. There is actually a Shoop Road here in um, Prescott. And apparently they're one of the like first group of um, gold miners or whatever that came out here was a Shoop. But I I don't know if I'm related. I'm still oh, okay. <laughs> That's why I like the history behind that. All yeah. right. I'm going to go ahead and, and introduce you for those who don't know you. Serena is a former corporate controller turned bookkeeping business CEO, mentor for other bookkeepers and accountants, mom of three. And a closet musician, which is really cool. I would love to know what you play. (laughs) She built her business as a side hustle to motherhood when she left corporate to have her second daughter. She's passionate about helping business owners become CEOs and take control of their money. So I'm super excited to have you on our call today. And thank you so much for being our first call of the year. And it's going to be a wonderful, I think, discussion about um, managing money and about how it can be um, used in the right way. So let me click admit all because there were two in the waiting room. And I think we added a couple more. Now I will go ahead and click the button to share the screen and you should be able to take over from here. Sweet. All right. Make sure I have a little chat box over here so I can see if anyone pops anything in there. I was going to say, make sure everybody mutes their mic. And if there are questions, put them in the chat so we can always discuss them as we go, as we kind of move through the meeting. Yeah, absolutely. So thank you so much for having me be your first presenter. This was such an honor and I'm super excited to be able to uh, bring this to our local community. So most of the business owners I work with are in the online space. (laughs) And so it's kind of funny, like we're here in Prescott, but we're still online. So it's cool though. I'm used to it. (laughs) Uh, So today I want to talk about um, the three secrets to becoming a profit conscious CEO and whether you identify as a CEO or an entrepreneur or a business owner, it's like interchangeable right now. The main goal is to become profit conscious and um, to not feel like you suck at money. So before we um, get started, Um, or before you guys start to like squirm in your seats about talking about money, uh, take a deep breath and remember that money is neutral. It's just like, it's just an energy. So, um, I like to start off with a a story that, um, happened not that long ago. And Melissa has heard this story before because she's heard, uh, she's heard a similar presentation. So (laughs) she probably knows the story, but I do have a 16 year old daughter And, um, a while back I asked her if she wanted to work with me in the business, I could pay her a wage and also get the business right off because I'm already like paying for all her stuff anyways, her gas and her food and whatnot. And, um, so over lunch one day we were talking about it. Uh, and I asked her, have you given any thought of what you would be interested in doing inside of, um, one of the businesses, either the bookkeeping business or the coaching mentoring business I have. And she said, um, not accounting (laughs) because I'm not good with numbers. So I would love to know in the chat, if any of you have ever said those words, either to yourself or to someone else, um, or even just like felt that internally, you're not good with numbers. And that is kind of like why you're telling yourself you're maybe not great at managing money or whatever your story is. Yes. On a regular basis, (laughs) it's a very common thing. Here's the thing though, money management and bookkeeping really has nothing to do with numbers per se. How good you are with managing money is more about your personality, your mindset, and following a few rules and making some habits. Uh, So today I'm going to be sharing some of those tips with you that help all money personalities manage your money better. So if you've said, I suck at money, I'm not a numbers person, I'm bad with money, or I'm not good with numbers. I'd like you to reframe those to I'm learning to be or how to become a profit conscious CEO or entrepreneur or business owner, whatever title resonates with you. 
And I love it if we can make a pact today, not to say these things anymore up on the screen, <laughs> the ones that are X'd out anyways. Um, I cannot stress enough how much power our words have. And just a side note, I never really considered myself a numbers person either. I can't do math in my head to save my life. I sometimes overspend and yet I somehow know I'll always find a way to make more money. Who can relate to that? Say me in the chat. <laughs> So we're going to call this money personality, the, it all works out type a little dreamer over here, <laughs> just knowing that the universe is going to take care of all of it. Right. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you have the white knuckler where, uh, you might be stockpiling the money that you get from like a real estate sale or whatever, not, um, not paying yourself afraid to spend money, uh, fear, fearful that it might all go away. Uh, raise your hand or say me in the chat if you relate to this this end of the spectrum. And then the third camp is where I want to get both camps to where we're going to focus today to help you become more profit conscious, which is a balance of both worlds, paying attention to your numbers and making value aligned money decisions that are good for you and your business. Sound good? Cool. So the three secrets to that are these three levels, money basics, money vocabulary, and growing your money. And so that's what I'm going to take you through today. Um, and then to kind of like brief overview what these three subjects are in the money basics, this is really like staying out of trouble. It's the most boring, but crucial part. So the bookkeeping type stuff. And then the second level is your money vocabulary. This, this will play into managing your money, paying attention to the right numbers and managing your money according to human nature. So like setting up guardrails around yourself to create the habits that you need. And then the third level is growing your money. Um, and this is really, we're going to focus on how to increase your profit and your cash. Um, and yeah, so that's what we're going to talk about today. Any questions so far? drop a question in the chat or a cue or whatever. And then for those of you who missed the intro, I'll just briefly reintroduce myself. I'm Serena. I'm a mom of three. I'm based here in beautiful Prescott, Arizona. I'm the owner of, um, at Of Course Bookkeeping, which is a consulting and bookkeeping firm for pretty much online expert businesses. And I'm also the founder and mentor at The Ambitious Bookkeeper and the host of The Ambitious Bookkeeper podcast. And that's where I mentor bookkeepers and accountants in starting and growing their virtual bookkeeping businesses. And um, like Sarah said, I started my firm as a side hustle to motherhood after I left my corporate controller position to have my second daughter. And I built my firm on part-time hours, freelancing through Upwork. And then I quickly realized how many small businesses could use the, um, the benefit of having the expertise that I had from, gained from corporate to help them build their businesses and become um, more profitable. So raise your hand if you're new in business. Maybe you don't have a bookkeeper or a CPA or anything like that helping you out. Um, and then if you are like more seasoned in business, just kind of like, let me know in the chat where you're at a couple years in, one year in, 10 years in, all are welcome here <laughs> just to kind of like gauge where I need to spend more focus on what to talk about, but I'm going to cover all of it. Don't worry. <laughs> A few years in, no bookkeeper yet, hopefully soon. Yay, Melissa. Yeah, that's okay. We'll get you guys going on the right foot. Um, two years of business, massage business in Prescott. Awesome. Cool. All right. So how important do you believe mon managing money is to the success of your business? In the chat, let me know. Very important, like meh, so-so, or not at all. <laughs> it's kind of, it's a trick question. <laughs> Not really. It's not a trick question. Yes, it's super important. So I'm pretty sure we can all agree that we're in business to some extent to make money, right? Um, so when I was growing up, another little story here, I would get major embarrassment about showing up to school late. And on several occasions when I got to school late, I was just talking about this with my husband because my daughter is the same, my teenager is the same way. Like she'd rather just not go than show up late. And so I would do the same thing. I would just skip the entire first period or the period right after lunch, rather than uh, um, walking in late, having all eyes on me. I was just wanting to avoid that whole situation, walking into the classroom late, people looking at me or the teacher calling me out, me having to explain why I was late. In reality, probably none of that would have happened, 
but rather than showing up late, I avoided. And I would also avoid going to classes on days where I was presenting, which is really funny because now here we are. Um, but it's just another, you know, proof that we can overcome these, <laughs> these patterns, right? So avoidance for me resulted in the accumulation of so many unexcused absences that I ended up suspended. And when I'm like bringing this back to talking about money, what happens to people when they avoid looking at their numbers is generally suspended financial success or worse. Um, but that doesn't have to be you. And you don't also, you also don't need to feel embarrassed about showing up late quote unquote to this, um, or avoiding it in the past. So I'm going to ask you to make another pact with me right now that you won't avoid the things that are making you feel uncomfortable anymore because look at me, I'm up here talking and I used to like really hate public speaking. <laughs> and I'm still like, I still get a little bit nervous, but I do it anyways, because <laughs> it's worth it. Um, so first up the necessary evil of keeping good records and staying above board. Uh, like I said, this is level one to becoming a profit conscious CEO. So let's cover some of those basics. Um, and uh, before we get into that, how confident are you to manage that money because we're gonna we're gonna help you with that today um and i do like i mentioned before i kind of gathering like who's who's who in the room i have a coach that says speak to the smartest person or the highest level in the room but um in order for us to like reframe how we view ourselves around money we do have to start with the basics so if i were only to speak if i were only to speak to those who like have their money stuff together hundred percent, which honestly, I don't even believe exists. I would be leaving out some really important, uh, basics that I don't think everyone knows. And so I'm going to speak to the beginner first, but even if you have a bookkeeper, uh, these might be things that your bookkeeper or your accountant has never articulated, uh, to you why they're so important or that why they need the information they need. Uh, but I will try to not bore you with all the details and make it as fun and light as possible. <laughs> And Melissa says, I need money confidence. Okay, cool. So you do not need to avoid the money stuff. Um, like I said, let's make another pact to just not avoid our numbers and let's get into this. All right, cool. So money basics, level one to becoming a profit conscious CEO. Separate your personal and business finances. And so when it comes to getting ready for taxes, you want a really easy way to differentiate the two. If you ever have to go back and prove like what's a business expense versus not, it's going to be way easier if you just have a dedicated business bank account that you only do business stuff through versus personal. Um, yes, sometimes things get a little mingled, but for the most part, if you can try to keep them as separate as possible, like have that dedicated business bank account or dedicated credit card. Um, it will make your life a whole lot easier. Uh, my recommendation is a separate bank account. And my favorite bank for our like online clients is Relay Bank because it's completely online and you can set it up in like five minutes if you have your LLC um, paperwork handy. Um, but if you are a local business and you deal with cash, uh, you may want to have a local bank um, in addition to it or as, you know, your primary bank. Um, that would be my recommendation with that. Now, number two is um, many business owners think that the bank statement alone is proof enough of your transactions, but it isn't. The IRS wants you to keep all of your receipts or proof of transactions. So we tell all of our clients to keep all of your receipts related to travel and meals and write on your receipt, the business purpose on the receipt. So like if you're taking a client out for lunch, say client X, Y, Z, why you took them out to lunch, trying to win their business or whatever. And then make sure that on the receipt is visible, the amount, the date, um, and what was purchased. And, um, for all other expenses, save anything over $75. I just say, especially if you have a lot of um, meal receipts, and that's a, an area that you spend a lot in, uh, you want to keep all of those receipts. Um, for recurring items like software, things like that, we usually just want like one receipt on file to establish the purpose initially. And after that, it's the same amount. So if you were to ever get audited, the auditor would look at that and be like, okay, well, it's the same amount every month. We see the first receipt, you're good. 
Um, so business dedu deductions, one thing to just remember about it is, are they reasonable and necessary? And if you have a, if you question both, you're probably in a gray area. And if you're ever in doubt, I would just listen to your gut. Like if you're questioning it, the possibility of someone else questioning it is fairly high. So for example, one of the things that comes up a lot is clothing. So a lot of people are like, can't I just, you know, buy this cute outfit because I'm doing a photo shoot. <laughs> No, um, it's not a business write-off if you can use it personally. Um, it could be a business write-off if it had your logo on it. So then making it more of like a uniform. So that's one example. Um, can you deduct your car or your lease? Yes, you can to the extent that you use it for business. So you have to make sure that you're tracking your business use of it versus your personal. So tracking the mileage and things like that. So anything that you could that we use in our personal lives that could be very easily construed as just a personal expense. You really have to make sure you've established the business purpose for it and the documentation. All right. And so the IRS also wants you to have a method for record keeping, whether that's a software, a spreadsheet, or even a paper ledger. <laughs> Raise your hand if you even know what a paper ledger is. I'm very curious. Nope. No, no business majors or accounting majors in here. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I've, I've actually interviewed an ex IRS auditor and he said that some of the easiest audits he ever went through were when people actually kept everything on paper, which is crazy, but those are usually the people that are very meticulous. So, uh, my preference though, is to use something like zero. That's the software I use. Uh, because it plays nicely with uh, a lot of payment processors like Stripe and PayPal. And it's easier to use for most people than QuickBooks Online. But if you already are on QuickBooks and you're fine with it, then stick with it. Um, some other popular alternatives are uh, for businesses without inventory are Wave and FreshBooks. There's lots of others out there, but those are probably the, the most popular. QuickBooks Zero, Wave, and FreshBooks. Um, and then another common question I get is how much should I pay myself? Again, this is always like, it depends. <laughs> it's like the standard accountant answer. It depends. Uh, but later on, I will be talking about strategies, um, so, so that you are working toward paying yourself what you need to, or want to. And also at the end, if you, um, I don't, I'm not going to bring it up on screen, but I do have like a spreadsheet that can help you calculate how much revenue you should be making in order to pay yourself what you want. We like reverse engineer your revenue goals based on how much money you want to bring home. Uh, so if you want that, um, I will share the link to it at the very end uh, for everybody to have access to. It's just a Google sheet. Um, so yeah. So one of the most common issues that I see is when... Um, it depends on how you pay yourself on what your uh, entity structure is basically. So how much to pay yourself is one question. The other question is how to pay yourself. So if you're an S corporation or a C corporation, you should actually be on a payroll service, having payroll taxes deducted and paying those in. I don't recommend calculating all that yourself. I would highly recommend using something like Gusto or ADP or something like that. Um, and if you are just a, a single member LLC or a partnership or a sole proprietorship, you actually just pay yourself with an owner's draw, which means you just withdraw the money from the business bank account and pay yourself with it. But you do need to set aside taxes from that, that you're paying yourself from so that you're not blindsided at your end, um, during tax time, which is like right around the corner. Um, so deciding on the most beneficial for tax purposes absolutely requires a custom analysis with a tax pro, uh, which brings us to getting help. Um, the all works out type might fall into a trap here with crossing their fingers and hoping to never get audited, while the white knuckler might become a little obsessive with tracking these things perfectly, but being really inefficient that they're spending valuable time doing your bookkeeping, maybe um, when you should just outsource it. So when do you know if it's the right time to hire a bookkeeper, accountant, a CPA? Um, and also what are all these things and how do they help? The short answer is honestly, as soon as you possibly can, even if it's only like a one-time consultation to help you get all set up and train you on how to do things yourself. Um, 
or train your VA to do things for you. Um, and as you grow, you can outsource that and get it off your plate completely. So let's talk about the different roles that I just mentioned, because this is definitely an area where I see a lot of business owners confused about like, who helps with what? <laughs> who should I go to for this? Um, Brie asks, should I be using a software to track purchases? What about a good old spreadsheet? Spreadsheet is totally fine. Um, especially if you do have that dedicated business bank account, you know that everything that comes through that bank account is a business expense. So now it's just a matter of exporting that detail into a spreadsheet and giving it a category. So like meals, um, auto expense, um, what else are you spending on software, um, continuing education, just grouping it into different categories that are going to show up on a tax return to make it easy for your tax pro to file for you. All right. So Let's break up, break down what each financial role does and the difference between a bookkeeper, an accountant, a CFO, a CPA, a tax pro. There's so many words for what we do and lots of differences. Um, so let's break it down. Bookkeepers are going to handle the day-to-day -day transactions and reconciling your accounts. And when I say reconciling accounts, I mean looking at what happened in the bank account and looking at what is in your accounting software or on your spreadsheet and making sure that everything matches and no transactions have been missed. So that's when it's very helpful to have that separate business bank account because then you don't have to worry even about sifting through the personal stuff. It's just business. Now your accountant or a CFO is going to compile the information analyze information for you, interpret the numbers for you, and possibly provide some budgeting or financial planning help, um, mainly helping you understand what happened in the past um, over here with compiling and analyzing. And then budgeting and planning is more forward-looking, so helping you be more strategic and plan for like, okay, should we ramp this area up? And what could our revenue be like if we focused here? And where could we save here? Those types of things. And your tax pro could be a CPA. It could be an enrolled agent. That's what EA stands for. And those people are going to prepare your taxes and possibly help you do some tax planning. Um, so a, a very common misconception and I run into this a lot, so I have to talk about this all the time, is I'm technically a CPA. I technically could file taxes, but I've chosen not to practice in that area. And instead I prefer to be right here in the bookkeeping accounting CFO work. Um, and I refer everybody to a different tax pro because my background, I mean, I do have some experience in tax, but it's not what I love. So <laughs> this is where I hang out and I refer people over here. Um, so that's, that's kind of the breakdown of all that. Any questions so far? Well, I get a drink. All right. So now, even though there are all of these compliance requirements, unfortunately, having all of this in place does not magically help you manage your finances day to day. Um, it just gives you a historic look at what happened so that you can apply that information to the future which is what we're going to um, cover next in your money vocabulary. So our money vocabulary is really to help you utilize the information from your record keeping to make decisions, to manage your cash um, and all that good stuff. So raise your hand if you have a revenue goal or try, type me in the chat if, you, um, if you've kind of figured that out for 2023, what, what you want your revenue goal to be or um, a profit goal or a goal of to pay yourself a certain amount. Yay. Yay for goals. <laughs> it's good to have some sort of a vision or a something to go towards, um, you know, like as a direction, if you will. Good. Cool. Yes. I have a goal for this year. Yes. Yay. Okay. But let's be real, most of us entrepreneurs run our businesses based on the cash in the bank, which is almost always going to be different from the profit on your profit and loss slash income statement. So we're going to dive into why. Um, so first, let's talk about the difference between revenue, profit, and cash flow. So your revenue is also considered your total sales or the top line. Pretty sure that's those are the main terms um, that you might hear around for 
the number at the top of your income statement, all the money in. And then your profit is going to be your revenue minus your operating expenses, also known as the bottom line or your net income. And then your cash flow is actually the total money collected minus the money paid out. And the difference is here. Your cash in on the cash flow is going to be your sales plus any loans that you applied for. So like if you have an SBA loan, that's cash in the bank, but it's not revenue. Um, so it doesn't show up on your PL or your income statement. And then also with your cash out, it's going to be your operating expenses plus any debt payments. So credit card payments or loan payments that you're making and your owner's pay. So um, if you're an LLC, if you're not on payroll, you're not booking that to wages, you're ta basically taking it out of your profits. This is very confusing for a lot of business owners. So if you're not getting this right now, it's okay. I'm going to give you the slides and you can study it. <laughs> um, or you can give me a call and we'll talk about it again. So which, which, which reports should you actually rely on? Um, we actually give our clients five reports every month because you need all the information together holistically to be able to make decisions. Just one single report isn't going to give you all the information that you need to make good, solid business decisions. So first report that we always look at every month is the P&L, also known as the income statement. And that's going to show you the profitability um, and your expense, your revenue, your expenses, and your profitability or your losses for a given period in time. Um, yes, there are lots of very, very valuable details on this report that I do want you looking at. It's just not holistic. So um, you'll on this report, you're going to see your individual expenses, your, your individual revenue streams if you are recording those separately. So for example, um, in my business, we have in the coaching business, we have some digital programs, some digital courses. I also do some one-on-one -on -one coaching. So I, I keep those as two separate revenue streams so I can see where my money is coming from. So if you have different revenue streams or income streams in your business, um, I highly recommend looking at them separately so you can see where your money is coming from. Just like you're looking at where your money's going to by uh, bucketizing all those into different categories. Now, the second report that we look at every month is the balance sheet. Um, I like to call this the redheaded stepchild that no one likes to pay attention to, but this one shows your financial health at a snapshot in time. So think of this as your business's net worth. If you're familiar with any personal finance type stuff, you might be familiar with net worth of your personal finances. So what it is, is your assets, which are cash, inventory, money that other people owe you. Um, so your customers, if you've invoiced them, but they haven't paid you yet, any equipment that you have. So computers, if you have a, um, a salon or something, it would be all of your salon equipment, things like that, or a building. Um, and then your assets are always going to equal your liabilities, um, plus your equity. So your liabilities are things that are credit cards, loans, money that you owe to vendors that you haven't paid yet. Um, and the equity is the, just the difference of your assets and liabilities, um, which when your business is continually profitable and your assets exceed your liabilities, you are building equity or value um, or worth in your business, if that makes sense. Within the equity account is also where you're paying yourself from if you're doing owner's draws. Um, so you could actually deplete all of your profits and have no equity retained in the business. Um, so that is a possibility, but um, it's always good to see that equity number building because that means your business is becoming an asset and has worth, quote unquote, right? Net worth. Now, the third report that we look, look at is the statement of cash flows. And this shows you the movements of your cash over a given period of time. So the PL and the statement of cash flows are over a given period of time and your balance sheet is at a snapshot in time. And this, uh, this report will combine the information from the balance sheet, um, the changes over the period and the PL to give you a snapshot of the change in the cash flows in your business on more of a macro level. So not as detailed as a PL, it'll just kind of show like cash from customers, cash to vendors, 
Um, that's what's in the operating section. And in the investing section, it's um, if you're investing in your business, if you're buying equipment, you're going to show cash movements from that. Um, and then in the financing section is where you would see if you receive a loan or you're paying down debt, um, that cash flow would be in that section or paying yourself as an owner's draw. Now, the other two reports um, may not apply to all business models, but they break down what you owe to vendors and what's owed to you on a detailed level. So you can chase after late paying customers or serve, uh, or it serves as reminders to pay your vendors. Um, so your AR is accounts receivable aging, and this is money owed to you by your customers. So your invoice listing, basically, of what's due to you. And your AP is your accounts payable aging, and that's money that you owe vendors. So if you have bills that you haven't paid yet, um, and you've entered them in your system, they would show up on the accounts payable aging. So let's take what you learned from all these reports and trends to make decisions together. Um, before I go on, any questions? It's kind of a lot. Like I said, I'm going to give you guys the slides so you can look back at this. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. So for instance, how much figuring how much money or revenue you need to bring in um, to your business. For this, we want to calculate your cash burn rate or also known as your break-even point. So you would take your total operating expenses, which again, you're not going to know this unless you're tracking it somewhere, right? So that's going back to the, the money basics of having a system to track things is not only for the IRS, but for you as a business owner to be able to make decisions. So you're never going to know how much money you're spending if you're not tracking it. So you want to take all of your operating expenses add in whatever you're paying down debt or paying yourself as an owner. And that's going to give you um, your, your cash burn, basically what you're burning each month or how, whatever time period you're looking at. I'm going to use monthly as an example, um, because it's good to know what you should be striving for as a revenue goal, revenue goal per month. So let's do a little mathy math. <laughs> if your total operating expenses are $5,000. So that's like, your, your recurring software fees, if you have a VA, if you're paying any other contractors, all that kind of stuff goes in your operating expenses. If you have rent or um, telephones, utilities, stuff like that in an office space, that's your, your um, operating expenses. If you have debt payments, you add to that because that's not going to be on the profit and loss. And then owners pay whatever you're paying yourself. So say your operating expenses are $5,000, you're paying um, a loan off and you're paying $1,000 a month for that. And then you are trying to pay yourself $5,000 a month to take home. You want to at least be making $11,000 in revenue each month to be able to cover those costs. And we're building and paying yourself here so that we don't forget about that right? <laughs> so this is your minimum revenue goal each month to hit if your expenses look like that. Your situation is probably going to be different. So part of your homework is to go home and calculate how much money you're spending every month so you can figure out this revenue goal. Um, so this would be if you have like a steady income every month of revenue, then you can, you know, this would be your minimum revenue goal each month. Or if you have a fluctuating or a seasonal um, cash flow, for example, like real estate, because I know there's a couple of you in the audience, you sell a house, you get a bunch of commission, and then you might not sell another house for I don't know how long. I don't really know what's going on these days with the market, but say it's a couple months before you sell another house. So you have to make that commission stretch. So you need to know how much you're spending each month um, to manage that. And so you'll take your whatever balance of cash you have after you've set aside a little bit for tax and then you divide that by your, your burn rate to see how many months you can run your business if you keep your expenses the same and you don't make any more revenue to make that revenue stretch. Does that make sense? So now we have like a real tangible goal to work toward. So I asked you guys earlier if you had a revenue goal. So go and do this math and make sure your revenue goal is in alignment with this. <laughs> Hopefully it's better and also almost achievable. <laughs> so um, real talk here, managing day-to-day -day is, like I said before, about building habits and behaviors. And one of the biggest issues I see is with overspend and not saving with taxes. 
So those two things combined can be very detrimental. So um, one of the my favorite tools for managing this, if you haven't heard of it yet or read it yet, is the book Profit First. I highly recommend that. Um, I usually help my clients implement implement a version of this that kind of works with them and their personality and their situation and whatnot um, to help manage the cash flow and to make sure they're setting aside enough money for taxes and paying themselves above all else. And then you operate your business on what's left, basically. Um, so to achieve this, we take all of the money in and we set up one bank account linked to your income sources. So if you have, if you have like Stripe or PayPal that you receive money from people or Square or any other payment processor, you would link that payment processor to this one income account. And that's where you're going to put all the deposits to your business. So if you're getting checks or cash, when you go and deposit them, you deposit them to your income account. And then we have our clients set up multiple other accounts. Sometimes they'll set up all of these and some clients are pretty good about just um, having like one or two extra accounts to manage their stuff, but profit, the whole like real profit first method is five accounts. Um, and this is where the muscle gets built and the habit for setting aside money for profit and tax and for paying yourself. Um, these are percentages um, of their benchmark percentages for a healthy business that's making less than $500,000 in revenue. Um, Sarah, are you raising your hand for a question or was that from earlier? I am raising my hand. Okay, for go question. for it. I just had a question about the five accounts. I've re I've heard the book. I want to read it. It's on my to-do list. So these uh, additional accounts, the four additional accounts are ones that you're going to be placing money in to save for these payments down the line. Yeah. Okay. So the premise here is to have one, one, one account where you're putting all the money in, and then we take it and divvy it up into these other four accounts. Um, and so these, like I said, these are the percentages that you would divvy it up. If you've like, this is the end goal percentage, basically of a healthy business. When you're first starting out just to build the muscle, I always recommend starting here 1% and your tax at maybe seven to 10%. If you're, if you've never saved for taxes or you're not really like, it's all kind of new for you. Um, and then doing the rest of whatever's left into these accounts, if that makes sense, because you want to build the habit slowly. It's kind of like when you're starting to, when you start a new year's resolution, I don't know if any of you guys have done that and fallen off the wagon yet. Uh, but I sure have, <laughs> when you start a new year's re resolution, you have all these big aspirations of like, oh, I'm going to go to the gym every day. I'm going to work out for an hour. I'm also going to take my vitamins every day. I'm going to drink five bottles of water and I'm going to eat three square meals a day with this amount of protein and da, 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 da. And it's like, that is way too much to take on all at once without like slowly building the habit. And that's why we all like fall off the wagon. Uh, it's going to be the same with managing your money. And so that's why I say like, don't ever try to start out at setting aside 5%. If you've never set aside diddly squat before you want to start very, very small. So 1% to profit, maybe like 10% to tax. Um, and also if you are actually spending 60% of your revenue on your operating expenses, you can't drop down to 30% right away. You have to do it in very small increments. Um, percentage points. And we hold to that for like a quarter. So like three months and then you adjust. Um, but yeah, the book goes through the whole process. It's also a very good listen. If you're into audiobooks, the author is humorous. He's fun to listen to. Um, it's a very quick listen if, if you like audiobooks. Um, so yeah, this is the ultimate end goal of percentage breakdowns. Um, but this is one of the areas that we help our clients. We'll get, we'll gather all the historical data to see what we're actually spending on our operating expenses and then give them a, a percentage to strive for that's more realistic to what they're already doing and then slowly start shrinking it down um, or growing revenue. <laughs> what is the book name? Oh, Profit First. I'm going to give you guys links to all of this at the end too. Um, they'll be linked like on the slides as a PDF. That way you don't have to take so many notes. All right. So um, profit and tax. I like to recommend if you are the type where if you see it, you'll spend it. If it's linked to all these other bank accounts um, and you, you'll spend it that way, then I would recommend having these two at a totally different bank account. 
And um, if you're a single member LLC, it is okay for those to be personal accounts at like a totally different like credit union you don't even like bank at. You know what I mean? That way it's like a lot of effort to take money out. <laughs> um, the bank that I'm loving right now for savings is the American Express high yield savings account, but it is a personal account and you can't link business bank accounts to it. So you have to like the way I transfer my money is I pay myself or I transfer it to my personal savings account from my business. And then I transfer it to the Amex. And that's where I hold my tax savings because I do not want to touch that all year unless I'm making estimates. Um, so even I have to put guardrails on myself. So we're all human. Um, and the, the rhythm I do this, I like to do this in is bi-weekly. So when I'm running payroll to pay my team, I also go in and do my money transfers and do all this tax savings and all that kind of stuff. Um, you can do it weekly. You could do it monthly. If you only get like one or two payments a month from customers, um, that works too. So the, um, another like next level strategy, if you have a bunch of cash from like a commission from real estate or seasonal revenue or something, and you're um, worried about managing that cash, we, um, go back to that burn rate that you calculated and you could create another account and we call it a drip account. And I have, since I serve course creators, they do launches, but it's kind of the same theory. They get a big cash influx and then we drip it out monthly just to cover the expenses that they have and to pay themselves. That way they're not like seeing a bunch of money in their operating expense account and thinking, oh, I have all this money. I can go join this $20,000 mastermind or whatever, right? <laughs> go to this trip or whatever. So that's how we help um, some of our clients manage that as well. Again, it really depends on your personality. If you're the type that's like, if I see it in there, I'm going to spend it. Then I would recommend doing something like this and just monthly dripping out that amount, the 5,000 to pay yourself to your owner's pay account, and then your 6,000 um, to cover your expenses. So when we work on um, where we work on increasing cash through profits is um, when we look at our money personalities, some of you might be the white knuckler type thinking I need to cut expenses. Where can I cut? And then the all works out type. You're not even thinking about making changes to your spending because you see the value in everything you're investing in and you see everything as an investment. But uh, let's be real. It could still kind of stress you out, right? Um, so then we are coming to level three of becoming profit conscious and building the profits in your business. And so there are basically four ways to grow your, your money, your cash, your profits, all that stuff in any business, basically any business model. These four ways are just going to be applied a little bit differently. So the number one way, very self-explanatory is increasing your prices. Now, as a real estate agent, you probably don't have very much control over this. So, um, sorry, <laughs> but if you're like a service provider or selling a product, this is the quickest, probably easiest ways to, um, to grow your revenue, but you also have to, you know, make sure your market is going to accept it. So that's maybe not always the best option. Number two is to increase your sales volume. So this can become a little more complex. You want to be increasing the traffic. So if you have a store, you're increasing the number of foot people that walk through your doors or a restaurant, increasing the number of tables that you take on the turnover. Um, you can also do this by changing your messaging or having more conversations, making more phone calls, whatever your strategy or method is for getting leads or prospects or customers in the door you want to increase the volume of that. And that's another way to grow, right? But we're all moms here, I think, and we all have limited capacity. So sometimes it's a combination of a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Now, number four is to optimize your internal efficiencies. So coming back to capacity as a mother, um, you can create processes within your business and outsource them to like a VA or something like that so that the $10 an hour tasks are being done by someone else. And your genius is spent doing the things that you're a genius at. Um, you can also control your spending a little bit. 
um, if, if you know that you're overspending in certain areas, but really you want to focus on just making things more efficient, um, rather than cutting costs that are necessary because it's, it's really hard to grow by cutting costs. And the fourth way is to increase your average cart value. Um, and so this is done with upsells and order bumps. I'm trying to think of a way that you could do this in the real estate world. And I'm drawing a blank because you're really, you're kind of stuck with whatever the sales price of the, of the house is, right? Whatever the buyer is willing to offer. Um, you can't really, I don't think you can really upsell them and order bump that, but in like a retail environment or a restaurant environment, it's like, has anyone here been to scooters recently or ever <laughs> the coffee shop drive through? Have you noticed that anytime you drive up before they even ask you for your order, they ask you, can I interest you in a maple waffle sandwich? Or can I interest you in a caramel muffin or a blah, blah, blah. They upsell you before you can even order. How many times have you said yes? Because I say yes almost every time because those maple waffle sandwiches are really good. <laughs> yeah, they're the, they're the best at this. And I bet they make a lot of extra revenue because of it. So that's an example of upselling. Um, an order bump is like when you're online and you buy like a little $10 workbook or something or a PDF, and then you go to check out and there's a little checkbox that's flashing. And it's like, for just $5, you can add this other PDF to your package. That's an, like a a order bump or a one click upsell basically. Um, in the grocery store, in the shot, in the aisle lines or whatever, they have the candy. Those are basically just to increase our, their average cart value, <laughs> get, get people to buy more before you leave the store. Um, whoops, let me go back. So drop in the chat. I, Cause I want to help people brainstorm here. What is your industry? Like who are your clients? And um, if you are trying to figure out how to do one of these things with what you do, except real estate, just kidding. <laughs> uh, but Sarah, if you have any pointers for real estate on any yeah. of these, actually, I was, just gonna, I was going to jump on for both. Um, so I don't even know if this is possible and we provide these free resources all the time, but I'm trying to think of something that realtors can use where if you have social media, if you have something like that, like Linktree account, um, take them over there and have an, uh, an ebook or something that you can either give away or mm -hmm. offer for, you know, five bucks or something like that. That would be a way, whether it's um, like you have a free buyer's guide, but if you really want an in-depth one, you can pay for the $4.99 version, which is like everything that you would want um, yeah. for a buyer's guide, things like that. But then also, I know my husband is wanting to start up some clothing stuff that he's been interested in. I'm like you have to do all of these things, all of these four things, because when you have branding in any way, um, upselling on these different versions is a really good way to increase your income. Yeah. Yeah. And adding like, like you were mentioning, like the little buyer's guide, like little digital resources, um, a few years ago, it was more popular to do freebies to get people on your list, which is also good. We do the same thing. We have some things that are like free PDFs. And then some things we actually charge a small amount of money on because, then you've like qualified the person. Like we know they're serious about doing this work if they dropped even 15 bucks rather than just the freebie. So like, if you want to like weed out the tire kickers that are just, you know, looking at houses for the fun of it, <laughs> they probably aren't even downloading the buyer's guide to begin with, but you could charge a small, just a little bit. And that creates more of like also like a loyalty to you. So when they are ready to buy, they're going to come to you and you continue to nurture them, um, by like emailing them or, you know, sending them a postcard or whatever, reminding them that you're there. Um, all right. So I'm going to look at the chat. Um, I know Brie has a buyer's guide too. Um, let's see life insurance. I'm reaching out to other professionals to offer another stream of income by being referral partners. Yes, that's a good, um, that's a good one too. We do referral partnerships too. Like, um, it's kind of like under the radar, but for my bookkeeping firm, but like every so often we'll just reach out to our current clients and be like, Hey, if you know of anyone that's like you that has a business and needs help, 
um, with what we do, we're accepting new clients and we'll give you a referral fee. And, um, I've just surprised a couple of my clients before, cause they'll refer people and they didn't even know that I was doing referral fees. And then I just like send a check in the mail because it's like the, the, um, getting a referral is going to be so, so much warmer of a lead anyways, because the trust is already built there. Um, so yeah, referral partnerships are great. Um, or you, you know, reaching out to other people, if you have a complimentary service to be like, let's be referral partners, um, you know, could you share like whatever percentage of revenue or like of their first invoice or whatever you get to work out the terms you can negotiate that, um, PDF sales are genius. Yes. And they're also serious about using you. Yep. Melissa online coach. I have lots of ideas for this stuff. <laughs> looking at growing by using affiliates, JV partners, and also promoting others as affiliates. Yeah. So that is, um, probably one of the best things that I did for my online coaching business to the mentoring was partnering up with people that were, I was actually like really in alignment with on like the way that we function and our values and things like that, um, and doing partnerships. So yeah, on my mentoring side, I do um, I give affiliate commissions to all of my past students too, because if they refer us and they use our link, like they get a commission. And so they like earn back basically the money they invested with us if they do a lot of referrals. Um, but yeah, that's a really good way to kind of like, I was just talking about like complimentary services or complimentary, um, like wherever your ideal client's going to be spending other money on, like try to get into like affiliate arrangements with those people. Brie lets people download her FAQ guide free, but only give buyers that schedule a consult, my full buyer's guide. I never thought of charging for my full one though. Yeah, that's a, yeah, you could do that too, for sure. Or even charging for a consult. <laughs> um, I started charging for discovery calls because I, I give so much value on those. Like, even if I know they're not going to be a good fit as a client, I still set them up with like, here's what you should do next type of thing. Or like, here's, um, you know, some pointers and tips to like be good to go. Um, yeah, because like, yeah, our time and capacity is limited. So if you're getting more leads than you can handle, or a lot of them aren't converting, then it's also kind of like, we got to filter out the people that aren't serious so that all of your time is spent on the people that are, are serious. Um, yeah, cool. All right. So that's pretty much we're right at one o'clock. Look at me. <laughs> that's pretty much it. I'm going to give you guys a, um, these slides as a PDF. And so these links are clickable. Basically this, these are pretty much all the resources that I mentioned plus some, um, this small biz starter kit, um, Katie Farrow is another example of someone that I collaborate with. We're technically competition. Um, she technically does the exact same thing that I do with this exact same type of clients. Uh, but she has created like a spreadsheet that you can just plug and play and use as your bookkeeping software. And, um, that's the link to that. So if you're like, I don't want to do zero, I just want to pay for something one time. And then, um, be able to manage it on my own. She's got a great resource for that. And, um, I've linked to the IRS, what they consider the acceptable, like proof of transactions and things like that. Um, relay bank, I mentioned, I have a DIY bookkeeping guide. It's like, kind of like what we were talking about. It's a download on my website, um, for free, but it walks you through the things that you should be doing each month. If you're doing your own bookkeeping, um, and gives you like a little checklist and then it will opt you in to my email list. And I just send one email a month, the beginning of the month to give you all the reminders of deadlines for taxes and things to think about in your business. Um, I like to think it's very value packed, so it's worth it. <laughs> and I don't bug you too much. Um, but you will also know when I'm accepting new clients and what kind of other offers I have going on too. And then profit first, um, was the book that I mentioned and Gusto is my recommendation for payroll. If you're an S corp and you have to be on payroll, they do have an option for S corp owners, like single member. Good to go. Um, so I'm going to open it up for questions. Hopefully now that 
we've been through all of this. You feel more empowered to start working on the money side of your business. And remember that it is not a one and done thing, just like any other habit. It takes discipline. It takes consistency to develop this. And it is not about being a numbers person. Okay. Remember, I'm not a numbers person. Um, it's a behavior and a habit thing mostly. And, um, it's like getting more comfortable on camera or increasing your visibility. Um, it won't happen if you don't show up for it. Uh, but imagine getting to April 15th, which is not that far away when your taxes are due and having everything ready to go for your CPA, money in the bank to pay your tax bill, and even what's better, having paid yourself consistently and predictably, um, whether whether your cash flow is fluctuating or not, and having a little bit stockpiled so you can relax between those fluctuations and knowing exactly when you need to like pedal to the metal, hit the ground, get more sales type of situation. Um, and you can show up and serve from a place of service instead of desperation for money. So go out there and commit to implementing at least one thing that we talked about over the next week or so. And let me know in the Facebook group, um, whether it's opening another bank account or, um, for your taxes or reading profit first, whatever that goal is, you don't have to decide right now, but try to take action, um, this week on something, get the, get the momentum rolling. Um, I'm going to take action on using the bank account that I did open for this specific reason about three months ago, and I'm yet to do anything with it. I just like keep looking at the the card that they sent. I'm like, I know I have to do this, <laughs> but I, I, that's definitely going to be a big takeaway for me is separating that. Um, now that I'm doing it on my own and just say, okay, this is, I have to do this. <clears throat> Excuse me. I have to do this in order for me to be able to manage it. Cause I'm definitely the dreamer. I'm sure Brooke knows that, but <laughs> <laughs> totally the dreamer like that's gonna work out it'll be fine there's some truth there is also some validity in that too like my husband gives me so much crap for it because he's like you're so woo woo always like the universe this and da, 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 da. but I'm like but honestly like we went we went to snowball this last weekend and it was a shit show to be honest because like we got there at 9 30 but they were already turning people around because the parking lot was full at the top. So they made us park at the bottom to take the shuttle up and they were running like two baby shuttles. We waited in line for the shuttle just to go up the mountain for, we, we didn't get up the mountain until noon and we had parked at like nine 30 and my husband was like, we're never going to get up there. I was like, not with that attitude. <laughs> Our <laughs> words mean stuff. You know, you got to trust a little bit. Yeah. But, um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, does anybody else have any questions? This was such a, it was a really powerful discussion. I really appreciate all that you um, provided us. I mean, and it was so easy to understand, which I don't think I was going to be able to hang in there. And I was like, wow, I get this. I'm understanding it. So thank you for putting it um, in layman's terms and easy realtor terms for me. <laughs> You're welcome. That's honestly, like, that is one of the, my biggest like whys, because there's so many like accountants and CPAs out there that I wouldn't even feel comfortable having a conversation with because they just talk down to people and I literally have the same background as them. So it's like, if I wouldn't feel comfortable in some of those conversations, then like, how can I change that for other people? So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Let me know if you have any other questions. Um, yeah, I'm going to give you the copy of the, the slides. I have like um, a little spreadsheet so you can reverse engineer your um, revenue goals if that's something that you haven't figured out yet. Um, and yeah, I will, um, I'll just share those, I guess, with Sarah or link them in the group, whatever works. Um, and yeah, you guys are so welcome. Anything else? All right. Well, here, just one second. I think I will go ahead and end it, I guess, oh. if anybody is all done. Um, and it, this is recorded. So I will go ahead to and put this in the Mompreneur Mastermind group too. So you can go back and look at those notes. And if you do have any questions, obviously reach out to Serena. She's in the group as well. And um, I'm sure she'd be happy to assist you with uh, anything that we went over today or any of your bookkeeping needs. So um, on that note, Thank you everyone for joining in the, the next meeting I'll have, I'll have actually a camera on <laughs> so you'll be able to see me, <laughs> but, um, have a great afternoon and, uh, yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> and, and that's it. Take care. All right. Thank you guys so much. This was awesome. Bye. Bye. Thank you.